Welcome back. And the topic today is to try to finalize this discussion about support vector machines. Now, since nobody actually suggested a topic for uh, project number three, we are not going to have a workshop uh, this year because next week we are getting to the last teaching week, which means that then it would typically be a little bit too late to present projects for project number three. However, if you wish to share things like that with people, you can always try to send suggestions via Canvas and the chat function which you have there. And then people may uh, hook up with you and uh, perhaps collaborate with you on a given variant of project number three. Now, what I want to do now is to quickly remind you of uh, what we did yesterday with the support vector machines. So this is a very popular method and it's one of the favored methods if we are dealing with classification problems, like we discussed uh, last week with the gradient boosting, which is also an extremely popular method. And what we did yesterday was to derive the uh, equations for the support vector machines for classification with what we called a hard margin. Now, this means that we have uh, identified points which are uh, away from the midpoint line, in our case, the two-dimensional case, or a plane by a certain distance n. And normally we want to make this margin as large as possible so that we can have two well-separated uh, classes. So we apply this to the case of uh, just two classes, and that could be a true-false outcome, minus one or plus one, which is the case we have been using. And then yesterday we discussed uh, this machinery of uh, uh, Lagrangian multipliers and Lagrangians, and then we optimize the problem. So what I wanted to bring up now is just the equations which we derived yesterday as a quick repetition, and then we are going to jump a little bit back and forth between uh, the equations and uh, uh, just running some calculations on uh, with a Jupyter no notebook. And then we're also going to derive the uh, support vector machines with a so-called soft margin. And we're also going to see how we can transform the data so that data which, which in the beginning could not be separated well in two classes, they can now be separated well by so-called uh, transformations, kernel transformations, where we can make a transformation of the original data set to a new one. And there we can clearly identify the classes. And then we can use the hard margin or what's normally called the soft margin with new additional parameters. So let's now just quickly remind ourselves of uh, what we did yesterday and the equations which we derived. And with that, we are going to move on to the case with uh, a so-called soft margin. So let me just bring up the, uh, the, the whiteboard so that we can remind ourselves of the equations which we had yesterday. So the, uh, equation which we ended up with were the results of a Lagrangian optimization problem. So we had defined then a problem with a constraint and we wanted to find the parameters W0 and a parameter W and as a function of a Lagrangian multiplier. And in our case, we ended up with a function which now contains these unknown parameters W. And then since we had a constraint that we wanted to be on this margin, so we are looking after the points, only those points which are on the margin. This means that uh, from a computational point of view, this is a sparse connectivity problem in the sense that if you have 10,000 data sets, there may perhaps only be five of these which are on the margin. And these are the points which we uh, keep with us when we are going to make predictions because they define the margin. So a results above the margin could be something which ends in a class where we have uh, y, the output equal to plus one. And below the margin, we would have a class which corresponds to an output of y equal to minus one. So uh, what we ended up with then is, a, is an optimization problem 
where we now run over all the data points, but at the end, we just pick only those fuse which are on the margin. And then we ended up with a Lagrangian multiplier. We had our output data, Y of I is our output. And we multiply this with a model, WT, and this was multiplied with X. So we're having a model which is linear on X. It doesn't need to be linear. So I'm soon going to change that a little bit. So we have plus W zero, which could play the role if you're thinking of a line which separates two faces or two classes, you could think of this W as a kind of intercept. And the problem which we wanted to find the solution to is actually a model, Y of I tilde, which is the way we label the model. And that is given by a vector W, which is perpendicular to the plane, which separates different classes. And in the case which we looked at, since we were dealing with a single a problem with two dimensions, we ended up with a, just a line which separates two classes. And this W is thus a vector which is orthogonal to the midpoint line, in that case, or just the plane which separates the classes. And this is multiplied with X of I plus this W zero. And if we make a drawing here in the two dimensional case, which we have been looking at, and as a function of X one and X two, these are the two variables. So that means that this vector X is just given by x1 and x2. And this vector w is given by two unknown parameters, w1 and w2. And in that case, we could have observations like these. And then we had circles. And these belong to a class which we call c1, which then would correspond to an output y of i equal to plus 1. And here we had another class, which we call for C2, which corresponds to an output, which we could define to be minus one. And then uh, what we found then was a line which separates these two classes. And then we could define in addition to that, we were able to define what we call a margin, where the margin is defined by the points which are closest to this midpoint line. So that means that in our case, we could define this point as the point which is closest to the midpoint line and that defines a margin. This is a case which we normally call the hard margin case. And what we did then was simply to have this constraint. And uh, with that constraint, that these points which we have when we multiply Y of I, the output data with the model which we have found, wt of x of i plus w0, we want that one to be equal to one. That's the way we defined the margin. And the margin corresponds to the inverse of the norm of this vector w. So if we want to maximize the margin, that corresponds to minimizing the norm of the vector w. That's the basic philosophy of support vector machines. Then what we did next was to set up the equations and we used the derivatives of the Lagrangians. So when we took the derivatives, let me quickly remind you of what we did. So we take derivatives and the problem which we have now is that we have a function which depends on several variables. And one trick which we did by taking the derivatives was to get rid of two of the variables. So at the end, we just have a function of one of them. And that function is the function which we then are going to optimize. So let me just quickly remind you of those steps. So we take the derivatives in order first to uh, simplify the Lagrangian, which we want to optimize. So we take derivatives. And these derivatives, which we are taking now, are going to be the derivative of uh, d of l with respect to w. And we want that to be zero. And that leads to w being equal to a sum of i equals zero to n minus one. If we take the original Lagrangian, lambda i, y of i, multiplied with x of i. And then we took the other derivative, but we didn't take the derivative with respect to lambda. And the reason for that is that we are going to rewrite 
the Lagrangian in terms of these equations. So what we had then was a new equation, which simply says that lambda of i of y of i is equal to zero when we take the derivatives. What we did next was actually to take this expression for w and bring it back into the equation for the Lagrangian, this equation which you see here, and simply put that back again, and then rewrite the equations. So what we got then was the following. So by inserting this equation here back into the Lagrangian, what we end up with then is the following. So we get a Lagrangian, which is equal to a sum over i equals zero to n minus one of lambda of i, the unknown parameters lambda. And then we have minus a half, and we have a double sum, i, j. We have a lambda of i, lambda of j, y of i, and y of j. And this was multiplied with x i transpose. So remember that the x is actually vectors. And you see now that what we have done is to rewrite this Lagrangian as a function of only one of the parameters by taking the derivatives. And that means that the next thing we're going to do now when we optimize is to optimize this function here with the constraints which we found for the problem. So that means that we are going to take the derivative of that Lagrangian as a function of lambda with specific constraints. And the constraints which we had were given as follows. So with constraints, and these are normally called the KKT constraints, the Kusher, Kuhn, Tucker constraints, after the authors which actually came up with these constraints back in the, before the war, in 39 and in the 50s. So these are normally called the Kusher, Kuhn, Tucker constraints, so KKT. And these conditions say that what we want to fulfill is Y of I of WT, and then we have X of I plus W zero minus one should be larger or equal than zero. So that's a constraint which we have. Then, if I multiply the same quantity with lambda, so if I multiply this with y of i of w t x of i plus w zero minus one, then this has to be equal to zero. So that's one of the conditions which we developed yesterday. And then we have that lambda of i should be larger or equal than zero. So these are constraints which we're putting up and finally, we have a lambda of i multiplied with y of i equal to zero. So these constraints which you see here, these are normally called the KKT constraints. And when we are going to put in a margin uh, with a slack parameter, so we can allow for some kind of uh, uh, results which are misclassified, we are then going to get similar equations, but they will just change slightly. Now, uh, you can rewrite uh, this Lagrangian, and this is something which we discussed yesterday. So we can rewrite the Lagrangian. And we can rewrite it in a more compact way in terms of a matrix vector uh, relation. So we can rewrite this one as a function of lambda only where we have the identity matrix multiplied with a vector lambda. So lambda transpose is now simply, so let me just put a, an aside here, up to lambda n minus one. So these are the Lagrange multipliers, which we have for every uh, input variable. And this has a minus, so let's repeat it here, minus a half of lambda t times a matrix P multiplied with lambda. And this matrix P, let's just spell it out again as we did yesterday. So this contains now Y zero zero, Y zero. And then I have multiplied with X zero transpose X zero. And this goes all the way up to Y zero 
y n minus one x zero transpose x n minus one. And this goes down, this is a dense matrix, y of n minus one, y zero, x n minus one of t of x zero. And then we have the final one, y n minus one, y n minus one, x n minus one transpose of x n minus one. That's the matrix. And you're going to see this matrix written in a different disguise. So we're going to generalize this matrix now by replacing this X with a kernel as it's going to be called. So uh, all these quantities which you have in the matrix are quantities which you can calculate because they are known. X is just your input and Y is your output. So these are the parameters which define the data set which we have. This is normally rewritten in terms of a kernel, which I'm going to define now. So this is going to be a K of X zero, X zero. And this contains now Y of Y N minus one. And there's a function K of X zero of X minus one. And this is going to be a function at the end here of Y N minus one of K of X N minus one of X zero. And this just continues like this. And this K quantity, K of X zero of X zero is now given as a function or let's write this a little bit more general. So let's just call this K of I and X of J is now a function of X I multiplied with a function of xj, and we would write it like this. This is a transpose because this is a vector. And in our case, we have just defined phi of x of i to be equal to x of i. So we would call this a linear function. But as you will see later now, we are going to change this one into a function which could depend on x squared, x cubed, and so forth. So we could have a polynomial. We can also have other functions like a Gaussian transformation. And these are quantities which we normally use to transform the data so that we can have a data set which previously did not separate well in the different classes, which now can separate well in the classes. So let's take, uh, before we now move on to uh, uh, the classification with a hard margin and move that over to classification with a soft margin, uh, let's look at some examples. So if you look at the general problem which you have, this is a, a problem where we want to find, so actually what we are going to do is actually to minimize this quantity because now it depends only with a rewrite. It depends only on the parameter lambda. So we can minimize it with that parameter with the specific constraints which you see. This is a normally called a convex optimization problem if the function is a convex one. So let's see how we can do that uh, ourselves. So let me switch back to the Jupyter notebook. And then we, uh, after that, we are going to derive the equations for the uh, soft margin. And if we get time, we are going to look at the case where we have uh, the support vector machine for regression. So what we are specializing now is support vector machines to classification where we only have two classes. Now you can extend this easily to more classes, but the basic idea was developed for actually two classes back in the nineties in the previous millennium. So one thing uh, I just wanted to remind you of, if you now uh, look at the specific case here. Uh, so the case which we looked at till now are cases where the two classes can be well separated, as you see here, okay? And this is a case, if you plot the two classes, then you can define the margin and you will typically operate with a hard margin where the points which are closest to the midpoint line, which you now would see with this uh, SVC, the support vector classifier, 
And this has a linear support vector. So you could think of this as the line which defines the, uh, the midpoint. And then this point here would be the one closest to that one. So the margin would be the vector which is perpendicular to this dotted line here. That would be most likely the closest point. Now, one thing which I showed you yesterday is actually uh, the uh, typical problem which we end up with. And uh, one of these problems is uh, how we separate uh, classes. So what you're going to see now is a set of data which I just made up, which I call X1. And then I have X2, which is actually X1 squared. So if you look at this specific case here, it's a very simple example. In the first case to the left, I've plotted my first data set with the axis. And in this particular case, uh, all the points, the, uh, uh, the, the triangles and the squares, they just lie on the line here. And in that case, you cannot separate them because you would have one of the classes would be here. And at the same time, it would be here. If you now square the data which you have, then you would see now, if you take the square of these quantities, which go from negative to positive values, you could then separate the triangles, which would be the first class, from the squares. So this is an example of this function phi, which I put up in the handwritten notes. So I can actually transform my data by just looking at the data. And I see that that transformation where I just transformed to X squared allows me now to separate well the two classes. And then what I could do now, since these are well separated, I could now just define a hard margin and then a support vector without any kind of soft margin. There's no need to do it because in this case, you see everything is well separated. So you always have to look at the data when you start uh, uh, implementing one of these methods here. Now, what comes next, which I actually wanted to say a little bit about, is the following type of problem which we have. So what we did was actually to set up this matrix. And we defined this matrix here to contain known parameters. We have the unknown parameter lambda. And then we have the constraints. So in the constraints which we had here, we had if we add a slack parameter, which we're going to derive now, there will be an additional constraint to the variables lambda. But in general, the type of problem we have is a problem of the type where we have the unknown parameter. So this is a normally called a quadratic optimization problem. So if you look back at the problem we had, we had the uh, vector lambda and the vector lambda here. So this is lambda squared. In our case, this is just given by the identity vector. So just a vector with ones. And then we had the matrix P, which is actually the object which you see here, which contains only well-defined quantities. And then we have some identities or constraints, which are now defined by this matrix G. And we may have a, a further equation which needs to be solved. So the typical problem which you often face is a problem of this type here. So let's take a closer look at how you can solve that problem. And uh, then we're just going back to some of the equations here. But if you now look at the uh, uh, mathematical optimization, uh, there is actually a Python library, which is called CVXopt, which means convex optimization. So this is a typical problem which we are facing. And if you look at it, uh, what you can do now is simply to include this library, cvxopt. You have to install it, obviously. This is actually a very powerful library, and I recommend uh, to take a look at it. Uh, just a small digression. This library, if you want to use that library for lasso regression, you can actually use that library to solve a lasso regression type of problem. So you don't need to write, a, because you remember that the lasso is actually a optimization problem with a constraint. And the constraint was that if the parameter lambda changed sign, you needed to put a minus one. If not, you had a plus one when you took the derivative. 
And that means that you have a convex optimization problem for Lasso. And this uh, library allows you actually to feed in your mean squared error plus the parameters beta and write your own code. Not exactly your own, but you can use uh, the convex optimization library to find the optimal parameters for Lasso regression. So this is the way, if you wish to actually use this library, it's a very flexible library, and it deals essentially with all types of convex optimization problems where you have a square dependence on the unknown parameter. So if you look at uh, what you need to do then, the next thing we can do is actually take a simple example. So suppose uh, you want, this is what we're going to feed in. So we're going to feed in this matrix G, this vector H, which now contains the constraints we have. So if you look back to your notes, you have this K, K, T conditions, which you would feed in here in this matrix G. So a typical example is actually this. This is not an uncommon case. So you have two variables, X and Y, and you want to minimize this function with those constraints. And uh, what you can do then, if you look at X and Y, you can rewrite X and Y in terms of a matrix, which has contained ones because you have only X squared. And then you have a vector where you then add the term with X and Y. So you simply perform a calculation now with X transposed or the, the total vector, which now contains X and Y. So what you see now is what I've done is to write this vector x transpose, which is x and y here. And then I have x here, which is now given by this quantity. And since I don't have any y square term, this just contains one. And then when I add up things, I'm going to get the, the final result here. And you see also that this q, this vector q transpose times x is actually given by this quantity, which you see here. So if you do the multiplications, you will actually get what you see here. Then we have the constraints. And the constraints are typically, if you have larger than, you would multiply that with minus one in order to get less than. So this function in CVX optimization, convex optimization, takes the reverse inequality sign. So that means you have to multiply with a minus one. And that's why you see now this case here, X and Y with minus one. And then, so this is the X condition. This is the Y condition. You see minus one has to be smaller than zero for X. Minus one for Y has to be smaller than zero. So I implement this condition for X. Then Y is that one. And then I have a one and three here, which is now implemented here in this line, less than 15 multiplied with minus one. Here, I don't need to multiply with minus one. So I get two X plus five Y. So you have two, five and a hundred and three and four and less than 80. So this is the way I would now define this matrix G, which you see up here, this specific matrix. Now in the problem, which I have, there is no matrix A times X equal to F. So I can just put that matrix equal to zero. And then if you want to use this uh, uh, suite of codes, this library, uh, you uh, call in, uh, they have a functionality which allows you to define a matrix. So I just specify that this is a double number D here. And then I take my matrix P, which now has just only one and zero. So, and zero along the non-diagonals. I define the vector Q, which is three and four. I define the matrix G, which now contains all these uh, different rows, as you can see. And these are just the definitions of the matrix. And then I define the vector H, which now contains zero, zero, minus 1580, as we did here. And then when you do that, uh, you can just call the solver. So solve a QP is for quadratic problem. And there are many different ways of solving it. For, so this library is very rich. And uh, 
if I do this solution here, you will find that X is equal to zero and Y is equal to five is the solution which now fulfills the minimization of the function with those specific constraints. So uh, I actually do recommend if you guys are going to deal with convex optimization problems, uh, try to take a look at this library. It's very efficient and it allows you, if you don't want to use scikit-learns lasso implementation, you can actually use the convex optimization implementation of the same type of problem. So you will actually, if you scroll through the library, you will find uh, the uh, a case which allows you to plug in the lasso optimization problem directly. And to write your own, there's a reason why we actually said use scikit-learn in project number one for lasso regression. Uh, you can do it with the convex optimization problem. Uh, but if you want to write your own, this is much more time consuming. And these are actually excellent libraries. So what you would need to do now is simply to define this matrix P. That would simply then be defined by this specific matrix. And then what you would then plug in in the conditions, which then define this matrix G, which we put up here, this matrix, you would then have to plug in this uh, KKT, condition, KKT conditions, which then will all be collected by this matrix G. And then you're ready to go and write your own support vector machine code with uh, convex optimization. Actually, scikit-learns library uses this library in order to find the uh, optimal solution of uh, the support vector machine algorithms. Okay. So one of the things which we haven't have promised to discuss is the case where we have a, a set of variables uh, for the input, which actually don't fit in the inputs and the outputs of a data set, which don't fit into the margin. So we're actually going to have results which may be misclassified. And this is something which leads to a, a modification of the hard margin to a problem with a soft margin and where we actually can allow for a certain amount of data which are misclassified. So let's look at this extension. And when we're done with that, we can try to look at uh, the uh, support vector machines for regression because they are slightly different from what we do when we do uh, classification here. So I'm going to go back to the uh, Jupyter to the whiteboard. So let's do that. Any questions in the meantime? Feel free to ask questions if something is unclear. So my hope is that you see uh, the basic philosophy here. And uh, we are going to set up the equations for the calculation with a soft classifier. So when we deal with this kind of classification problems uh, and we have data which uh, or classes which cannot be well separated so one thing you could do is to make a transformation of the axis as the one I showed you where you could not separate the classes, but then you squared the data and then suddenly you could separate it. That's one way of doing that. The other way is to introduce this slack parameter or the third way is to have a combination of both of these recipes. And that's normally the most standard one. Now, the kind of transformations which I showed you was based on an inspection of the, of the data which you have. And sometimes this is easy and you can easily see what kind of transformation you need of the X values. In other cases, however, you need to play around with different types of transformations. And that leads to a, a change of this function K, which when we set up the matrix, which we call the kernel, and you can have different types of kernels and transformations. So you can have a polynomial of a given degree. You can have a Gaussian transformation. So you can multiply your X's with a Gaussian and so on and so on. There are different types. And when you don't know what the data looks like, you don't have the possibility to plot it. Many people actually use these kernel transformations as just an additional parameter. Yeah. Yeah. 
Are, are there any constraints in the... You can use you can use that, but normally what you want to is to because this is a convex optimization problem. You want to have a function which makes the matrix positive definite. So that's a constraint which you would have on the type of functions. So you don't want something which can give you negative eigenvalues. So that's the essential constraint on the type of transformations. Then another constraint deals always with the. Uh, the number of CPU cycles you're willing to spend. So if you make the function more complicated, then clearly you would need more cycles to perform the transformations. And since you're doing this often many, many times, it means that clearly you want to reduce the computational complexity. So there's always this kind of trade-off between the accuracy you want to have and the complexity you want to achieve and the computational uh, expenditure which you're willing to, to pay. But let's now look at this other method, which allows us to include misclassified points. So we are going to look now at the margin. With the misclassifications. So we are still dealing with a classification problem. And we are later going to see how we can change this to a regression problem. So this is normally called a soft margin. And we are going to introduce a parameter which is called a slack parameter. So let's make a drawing here. So suppose now that we have a, a data set uh, with the circles and crosses. And then we have the crosses here. And then we found the margin. So let's mark the margin in red here. So suppose that the margin goes here. And then we have a similar one here. So just imagine that these lines are actually straight lines, okay? They don't look like straight lines. Now, what we could have now is a data point. So, so remember again that when you look at the this specific case here, so this will be the class C1, where we have the output y equal to one. And this will be the class C2, where y is equal to minus one. Now, what you could have now is a point which could be here. So this point would now have a distance from the margin. So it's a perpendicular one. And where we have a parameter C, which is smaller than one. So if I am on the line here, then this parameter C is equal to one. And this is also the case where our prediction Y of X is equal to zero. Okay, this is the way we have defined the midpoint line, which separates the two classes. And then we have values above zero and below zero, and they belong to the different classes. But with the margin, we now have a, a set of points which define the distance from the point which is closest to the midpoint line. Now, however, what could happen? So let's circle this in, this specific point here. So this could be a point which is not uh, above the margin, it's actually inside the margin. This is uh, correctly classified, however. So just keep that in mind. This is correctly classified. So what we are introducing with this parameter uh, C is a slack, a small slack compared with a hard margin, which we defined previously. So we allow for some of these dudes actually to be uh, put in uh, between the midpoint line and the margin. So we wouldn't call that misclassified. However, we could have another point which would be misclassified. So you could think of having one of the X's here. 
and we could have some of the circles as well. So if we do that, then this parameter C is actually larger than one. Does that sound uh, reasonable to, to define a parameter like that? So remember now that the margin, the distance has been normalized by the vectors W so that the margin is equal to one. And then that means that when uh, Y of I is equal to one, then we are on the margin. When Y is equal to zero, our model, the Y, it's not Y, but Y tilde, which is the model we are making, because we are making a model. So just remind, remind you of that. What we are making as a model is Y of X, which is given by WT of X plus this parameter W. So when Y tilde of X is equal to zero, then we are on the midpoint line. or the line which separates the two classes. And then when it's equal to one, we are on the margin. And when it's equal to minus one, we are on the other margin. So what we are going to do now is actually to introduce a parameter. So which we define as C for each data points. And then we can have this one to be on the correct side and we can have it to be on the wrong side of the midpoint line. So let's just set up some of these quantities with words and then proceed in order to set up the final algorithm which is needed. So we are going to define this parameter C of I equal to zero for data points on the correct side. on the correct side of the margin. So what does that mean? That means that if I have a point like this one, this is on the correct side of the margin. And there we put C equal to zero. Then, what we can do next, we can now define this C of I equal to the difference Y of I minus Y of I tilde. So these are the uh, one other data which we want to uh, hit. And then the other one is the model which we make. And we define that for other points. So remember now that these other points they can be correctly classified and misclassified. So if this difference is larger than one, then we misclassify. If it's smaller than one, then we classify correctly because if it's smaller than one, then we are here. That's correctly classified, but we have a kind of slack uh, with respect to the margin, to the hard margin, which we put off. If it's larger than one, then we are definitely misclassifying. Does that sound reasonable? So we're just putting up some, uh, an additional parameter, which we now want to include in the optimization in order to define this kind of uh, a soft margin. So let's go back now. And so uh, a data point on the decision boundary will then have uh, y, the c of i equal to one. And if it's uh, uh, c of i is larger than one, so we would now say that c of i larger than one, this is a misclassified point. And if I have c of i less than or equal than one, then it's classified, or it's actually less than one, because if it's zero, then we have the, uh, it's, uh, sorry, it's less, less or equal than one, then it's classified correctly. And it takes values only between zero and one, because when it is zero, then we do have a correct classification. So with that, what we can do now 
is to replace the classification constraints. So we can replace the constraint which we put. The original constraint was Wt times x of i plus w0. And we wanted that one to be larger than one. This is what we did originally in order to find the support vectors. So that's the original, the hard margin. So let me just put that in here. This is the hard margin case. And then I'm just gonna set that one and then we take a small break. And we call this y of i times y of i tilde, which we also have been calling y of i of a function f of I, x i larger than one. And this is now replaced replaced with a new condition. So we have y of i, wt of x of i plus w zero is now larger or equal one minus this parameter x of i. And this applies to all i from i equals zero, one, two, up to n minus one. So this is now my new constraint where I now have this parameter C. So after the break, we are just going to bring this back into the definition of the Lagrangian. We are going to find the new KKT conditions. And then we have the final recipe for constructing a support vector classifier with a soft margin where we allow for some data points to be wrongly classified because we cannot separate the classes exactly. If you could separate the classes by a smart transformation with a given kernel, then you would then obviously proceed with a hard margin. Normally what people do is to use both a soft margin and a given kernel transformation. That's the standard recipe. And we are going to see uh, implementations of this after the break. But first we need to derive the equations for it. And I've gone a little bit over time, that was on purpose. And then we take a, a small break now. So with the uh, uh, settings which we have discussed before the break about the uh, uh, soft margin calculations, what we have done now is to change the uh, condition which we put uh, when we define the margin. So when we are on the margin, uh, this uh, uh, old hard margin relation simply said that the y of i times our model had to be equal to one. That's when we are on the margin. And when we have a result which is larger than one, then we are classifying correctly. We also classifying correctly when it's equal to one because then we are on the margin. But now we want to bring in this kind of uh, slack parameter. And what it means now uh, is that this slack parameter, when we look at it, uh, we uh, need to satisfy a constraint on the slack parameter. So we want this slack parameter to be larger than zero. And that is pretty obvious because if it is uh, uh, negative, then we get one minus times a negative number. So we're gonna get a number which is larger than one then. So uh, the constraint on, on C is that it's a number which is uh, a larger than one and a positive number or it could be zero. And then we are going to find uh, values of C, which are then in between zero and one. So these are the kind of constraints for where we are uh, looking at results. So these results, uh, which we have here, they lie inside. So let me just take away the less than and equal and just do that. So these are points which lie inside the margin, but are on the correct side. So let me write this down. Points which are inside the margin or on the margin, but on the correct side.
just to remind you of that, if you go back to the figure which we had before the break, you see now that if uh, epsilon, oh, no, sorry, C is equal to one, then we are uh, at the midpoint line. If uh, C is equal to zero, we are exactly on the margin. So when we are between zero and one, then we are still within the set of data which we would call correctly classified. Then, if we have a xi larger than one, clearly, or xi larger than one, these are, are misclassified points. Now, one of the things is that the approach uh, which we are looking at now can allow for overlapping, overlapping class distributions, but it, it's still going to be sensitive to specific outliers since the penalty which we are bringing in for classifications that can actually increase linearly with the value of C. So the goal now is to uh, uh, maximize the margin softly uh, penalizing points that are in uh, or on the wrong side of the margin. So what we want to minimize now is the following function. So we want to minimize a function where we have a constant C and then we have a sum over this N minus one of Xi plus this function here. And this C is a parameter which is larger than zero. And that C, that controls a kind of trade-off between the slack parameter and the margin. So you can think of this as a kind of parameter which controls a trade-off between the hard margin, between, or we should rather say the slack parameter, parameters COI, and the margin. So clearly this sum uh, depends clearly on the number of parameters. We want this sum of a C of I obviously not to blow up. So what this parameter C is doing is actually to control that this sum over the misclassified points doesn't blow up. So you can think of that as a kind of regularization parameter. So this becomes a parameter which you will see now when we're going to run codes, you will see that we can tweak this parameter in order to regularize the misclassification amount of points. So we are now going to define a new uh, Lagrangian where C is a fixed parameter. So when we are running the calculations, we are going to fix C. So that's a parameter which we are not going to optimize. It means now that we are going to have a new Lagrangian and since we have an additional constraint on these parameters Xi, so we don't want these parameters Xi to increase beyond a certain value because we don't want the term which you see here to blow up. So if we have many misclassified terms, we now want to actually constrain the value of this specific sum. So we're gonna put a constraint on that, that it shouldn't be larger than a certain value. And that's something we can implement with a Lagrangian multiplier. So we would then have a Lagrangian, which now depends on the parameter we want to find. We have this new parameter, the slack parameter. We are going to have a Lagrangian parameter as before, this parameter lambda, and we're going to have a new one, mu, which acts on the slack parameter. And the um, Lagrangian is going to be given by the function we want to optimize as before. This defines the hard margin. But then we have the slack parameter with this uh, constant 
C, which we need to put in as a new hyperparameter. So you can think of C as a regularization parameter or just as a hyperparameter, which then tunes the relation between the slack parameter and the margin, which we have defined. Then we have a minus, and here we have a minus with a, the same term, so not a half here, but it's a summation. And then we have a sum over all the terms of n minus one of lambda of i, and then we have y of i, and this is as before, except that now we have uh, this in, to introduce the slack parameter minus i plus the slack parameter for that specific data point. And in addition, we have a constraint on these slack parameters that it shouldn't grow beyond a certain value. So we are going to have a new parameter mu multiplied with the slack parameter. So this is now the Lagrangian. So when you put in a new constraint, then you have a new Lagrangian parameter. And these constraints act on the slack parameter now. So what we don't want to is that the sum over all the slack parameters doesn't exceed a specific value. So since these are Lagrangian multipliers, so like the Lagrange multipliers, These are lambda of i, and they are normally large equal than zero, and mu of i, which are also larger and equal than zero. So the um, uh, corresponding set of uh, KKT conditions are now the following. So we have to change a little bit. So the KKT conditions, they are now given as follows. So I have lambda of i larger or equal than zero. I have now y of i multiplied with w transposed, x of i plus w zero minus one plus the slack parameter. And we want this one to be larger than zero. When we multiply this equation here with the slack parameter, no, sorry, with the Lagrange multiplier, then we require that this one should be equal to zero as before. And then we have further uh, assumptions. So we have mu of i large equal than zero. We have the slack parameter, the way we have set up the geometry now so the slack parameter should be larger or equal than zero. It doesn't make sense to make a negative one, as we saw from the drawing which we made. So this is followed just simply from the basic assumptions we are making. And then we have that mu of i multiplied with this parameter is equal to zero. And the last equation plays the same role as the equation which you see here for lambda. So these are the so-called KKT conditions which we then, if we are using convex optimization as an algorithm and this software, this library, CVXOpt, then we would have to plug this in, in terms of this matrix G, which we saw before the break. And then we can plug in these six different conditions into that. So what we do ne next is that first we take the derivatives with respect to these parameters uh, the slack parameters, W and W0, as we did before, in order to simplify the Lagrangian so that it only depends on the Lagrangian multipliers or the Lagrange multipliers, which is a better word. So we can now rewrite. So it's the same trick as we had before. So we would rewrite, and let me spell this out correctly here. Rewrite. Uh, L of uh, omega, no W, W zero. And then we have the slack parameter. We have lambda and mu only in terms of the parameter lambda. So let's see how we can do that. In 
just L, which depends on lambda. So what we're going to do now is simply to calculate derivatives. So we calculate the derivative with respect to W, and we want that one to be zero. And that gives us the same function which we had before. We find the value for W, and this is given by the sum over lambda I multiplied with Y of I. In our case, we have X of I, but in general, we could think of this function phi of x of i. This is now a vector. In our case, this is just linear, and that's given by x of i. But we are not limited when we now make the model. So let me just have that as an in small insert here. So our model is given by wt x of i plus w0. And we can rewrite that in a more general form as a function phi phi x of i plus w0. This was just a small insert where we now have made a transformation of the data. As you saw before the break, if we had this uh, two classes, which could not be separated by just squaring the x's, we could separate cleanly the two classes. So that would be a typical example of this function phi. So if we wish to be more general and not specify just a linear dependence on, on the x's, we could now just plug in this function phi here. So the next thing we do is to take the derivative with respect to w0, and we want that one to be zero. And that simply means that we have a sum of a lambda i y of i equal to zero. Then we take the derivative with respect to the slack parameters. So we want to optimize these as well. And that simply leads to us being able to replace lambda of i with c minus mu of i. So the only thing we're doing now is just to take the derivatives with respect to the slack parameter in the original Lagrangian, which we had up here. So if we take the derivative of this function here with respect to the slack parameters, so we have a slack parameter here, we get a lambda of i here, then we take the derivative here, we take the derivative here, and we want to drive it to zero, then we get simply c, and then we have the lambda of i, and we have the mu of i. And then we can uh, replace everything now in the equations. So by plugging in these equations here, we can now transform the equation for the uh, Lagrangian. So if we do all the, do these replacements, then we get L, which now depends only on lambda. And now it looks like as we had before. And then we have N minus one. And then I have a lambda of I minus. And I have a factor of a half of I J. And then I have my lambda of I, lambda of J, and Y of I and Y of J. And then I have my X of I transpose X of J. And this quantity is normally rewritten in terms of this kernel object, which now normally corresponds to either the multiplications of these two functions phi, or in the linear case, just the inner product of two vectors. So this is similar to what we have done before, except that now the constraints are somewhat different. So uh, what we note is the following. Note. So we have, uh, let me also quickly remind you, we have this uh, KKT conditions. So we have these conditions to fulfill this one when we are setting up the optimization problem now. We need to set up the optimization problem with these conditions as well. But the only parameter which we are going to optimize in the calculations is lambda. Because now we have rewritten the whole Lagrangian just in terms of lambda by taking the derivative. So when, when we are going to optimize this quantity, we now just need to take the derivative with respect to lambda, which is the only unknown parameter. And when you have the derivative respect to lambda, then you can find all the other parameters. So what we note here is that uh, since lambda i is larger than zero and this mu Sorry, let me just write it 
correctly here, since this is also uh, larger than zero, that means that this implies that this lambda y has to be smaller than the constant c. So what we have to minimize then, the uh, parameter lambda with fixed c to minimize with respect to a constraint with respect WRT, a constraint or, con or several constraints. And this is with the fixed value of C, which you will set as a parameter. So you would have lambda larger or equal than zero and smaller or equal than C. And then we have also the condition to be fulfilled here, lambda of i, y of i equal to zero, which you would plug in in this matrix. And then we need to satisfy the following constraints as well. Satisfy the constraints at y of i multiplied with wt of x of i plus w zero is equal to one minus C minus a slack parameter. And then we also have uh, the slack parameter multiplied with the Lagrangian parameter mu equal to zero. So if mu of i is larger than zero, then to fulfill that one, the slack parameter has to be equal to zero. And that means that we are on the margin in that specific case. We are on the margin when we are optimizing the problem. So remember now that when the slack parameter is put to zero, then we are exactly on the margin here. Then we have a, uh, the final uh, set of uh, conditions. And that is clearly that if, uh, this parameter, if mu of i is equal to zero, then this c of i is larger or equal to zero. And then we actually are can have misclassified points or we can have points which are on classified correctly, but on the right side. So these are the kind of conditions which we get. And uh, when we now have it found these parameters lambda and mu, then we are ready to calculate the last parameters W0. And W0 is then calculated in terms of the points which are on the margin or within the soft margin. And these are the only points which we will take care of when we are going to calculate the final parameter, which is W0. And that can be because now we have found W, we have found lambda, and we have found mu, we have defined C as an input, and then finally, we can calculate W0 by using only the points which are on the margin or defined by this misclassification parameter. Okay, so uh, let's go back to uh, some examples and see what this can look like when we are running codes here. So let me stop here, and then we go back to the uh, to the Jupyter notebook. And let's take a look at some uh, simpler examples. And in this particular case, the kind of examples we are looking at uh, is just an example where we generate a simple class. And in this typical case, what we have is a simple class of points just two classes. And uh, this is done by generating the so-called moons where I can define the data in terms of uh, two classes with different colors. And what we have here is just a plot of the data sets. But if you now look at the uh, support vector machines here, which we are doing, we can now define these parameters C. So this is a linear support vector machine we are doing. So we can define a parameter C equal to 10. So this becomes a parameter in the theory. And then we would plot it. 
uh, we can define uh, a kernel, which could be a polynomial. So we could start with uh, the no kernel definition, and we would then have a polynomial here in just in degree, uh, actually this is a polynomial degree three, which we are looking at. We uh, can then define a polynomial kernel, as you can see here. We can define a parameter C equal to five. And then we can proceed by defining a Gaussian kernel. And you would then see the definition when we scroll down a little bit here, where we now have a uh, kernel here, which is an RBF. So this is the Gaussian. We have another parameter C. So these are typical parameters which we can play around with. And then you can also play around with different values of this parameter C, which now go from uh, uh, 10 to the minus uh, three to 10 to the power of three. So if we run this case, uh, what you would see then is the original data, which looks something like this. And this is a typical case where you cannot separate nicely the um, two classes, right? So this is just generated randomly with this uh, uh, functionality which you have in scikit-learn, which just makes this data set and it's just called make moons. So what you could do next then is clearly to modify it by defining a uh, given uh, kernel transformation. So you could actually try to find a kernel transformation which allows you to split the data. Alternatively now, you can uh, define this parameter C and you have a, a soft margin. And you can see now when you play around with this parameter C, you can then increase uh, or decrease the kind of type of slack. So in this specific case here, you would now see that basically all the data sets are classified correctly. And if you scroll down here, you can now play around with other types of parameters. And you will see now that it's not classified correctly. You will have still have many parameters which are, or many, many of the outputs which are not classified correctly. Whereas in this case here with a parameter C, which now is a hyperparameter, you will then get uh, almost all of the points classified correctly, except the one which you see here in the middle. And then you can play around with different values and different types of transformations. So in this specific case, I seem to remember that we had a uh, Gaussian transformation of the data sets. So these become then hyperparameters in your theory. And it means that you would have to play around with different types of kernels and different types of this hyperparameter C, which then function as a kind of regularizer between the margin and the slack parameter. And the larger you make it, normally this parameter C, the more easily you can actually include all data sets because then you make the slack parameter much more flexible. Okay. So the, um, uh, these were typical examples of uh, how we would uh, proceed when we run a calculation with support vector machines for classification with a soft margin. And you can do two things. One is to use both the soft margin and a kernel transformation, or you can just use a soft margin and just a linear kernel. This is the example which we have been looking at most of the time now. But then you can clearly transform your data and play around with different types of transformation. And this is actually what people end up doing. Because sometimes you don't know a priori what your data is looking like. This is a simple case where I just generate two classes which are often easy to separate. Okay, so uh, any questions so far? Because then uh, what I would like to now is just to sketch to you the way we actually would proceed if we do support vector machines for regression. And then next week, we are going to dive into uh, studies of uh, unsupervised learning methods. And one of the methods which we're going to look at is called principal component analysis. And the principal component analysis is actually a way by effectively reducing the number of degrees of freedom uh, from your design matrix by setting up the covariance function and diagonalizing it and just keeping the largest eigenvalues because the largest eigenvalues will be this, yes, 
will correspond to the features which have the largest variance. Okay, so let's uh, switch back to the whiteboard and then set up the, uh, the final uh, piece which we need when we do support vector machines. And this is support vector machines for regression. And then we should have basically the ingredients which are needed here. Now, I should say that when I've been using support vector machines for regressions, the results which I've gotten are not the very best ones. And I've never been too happy with it. I've been playing around with different kernel transformations, but they normally never beat uh, methods like deep learning methods like neural networks. And similarly also, if you have tried this XGBoost, this uh, extreme gradient boosting library and also gradient boosting methods, they often don't do as well as standard linear regression when it comes to regression problems. But I just wanted to show you how you can implement the support vector machines for regression. So let's put it up here, SVM or regression. Now, if we look back at what we have done is typically to define a cost function C or an error function or a loss function, which is given by some kind of mean square term where we have a Y of I minus Y of I squared plus Lambda. And then we will typically have something like the parameters W, which we previously called beta. <laughs> so we're calculating the norm of that quantity. So that would be a typically a typical L2 norm, which we did when we set up ridge regression. So what you're seeing here is nothing but good old fashioned ridge regression. Nothing but that. Now, the problem here is that if you now think of the philosophy we have developed for support vector machines, we were just looking after some few points. We are looking at the points which define the margin. So that means that we are looking at uh, what we normally call a sparse connectivity problem. So we are not interested in all the points here. We are not interested in optimizing this function for all the data points, but we are interested in finding a way to classify or to find to define uh, or a specific function we want to fit just in terms of some few points. So that means that if we want to run or go ahead with that function, which now runs over all the problems, that defies a little bit the philosophy of support vector machines. So just keep that in mind. The basic philosophy of support vector machines is that this is a sparse connectivity problem. We are just interested in those points which define the margin for us. So here we would deal with the uh, whole problem. So, but for, for the philosophy of SVMs, SVMs, they deal with uh, a sparse solutions to the above problem. Let me just correct that one. And with sparse, I mean only few points which define the margin. So if you have a data set with 10,000 points, perhaps it's only five which are interested in to the above function. So what is common then is actually to introduce another function. So you wouldn't deal with the cost function as you see it, but what you normally do is to replace the C with what is called C, the cost function, with something which is called a epsilon insensitive cost function. And I'm trying to explain to you what that actually means by a epsilon insensitive 
post function. And when we say epsilon insensitive, that means that we have defined a parameter epsilon. So this function, which gives, this is a function which gives zero. If the absolute value of the difference, I'm just writing this down in words here, of the difference between our model between our model Y tilde and the data point is less than a specific value. And Y is less than epsilon. And this epsilon is assumed to be larger than zero. So there is a simple function which you can define then. So we could define a function E of this epsilon which depends on y, on the difference between y and y tilde, which now could look something like this. It's zero if we have y minus y tilde, the absolute value is less than this parameter epsilon, which we have fixed. And then we could have y minus y tilde, the absolute value, minus epsilon otherwise. If we make a plot, what we what this could look like, if we plot it, suppose now we make a plot of this function as a function of a, an argument z, and then we have this epsilon, e of epsilon of z. It means that when we have plus epsilon here and minus epsilon here, then this function is just zero. It would look like this. And then for values below, above that one, it just becomes a straight line here. You should compare that to the standard mean squared error, which we have seen before. So if we were to plug in the standard mean squared error, it would look something like this. So this would be standard MSE. So, uh, in this specific way, uh, what we want to do now is to define a function which is sensitive to these differences because that is going to allow us to define a margin. This is the main reason why we actually put this function up like this. So let me bring that back again. So what we would do is to define again a new parameterization, y of i tilde, which is our model, which is given by this unknown function w. So this is a vector of a, a function phi of x of i, which depends on our inputs, plus this w zero. We could have a linear behavior or we could have a more complicated behavior. So what we would define then is a um, cost function c, which is going to be given by a constant, uh, which I'm gonna call for uh, beta. And this is multiplied with a, the sum over these functions, this epsilon insensitive function, which depends on y and y of i tilde, plus the standard term, which we had seen before. And these w's are now going to define the margin for us. That's the, gonna be the basic philosophy here. So it's just as before. So the W's are going to define the margin, but we have to define an additional function, which now tells us uh, whether uh, the, uh, the function difference is okay or not. And you can look at this now in the following way here. So you can, uh, if you make a plot here of, uh, this specific function as a function of this parameter x. So suppose now this is our best model. So this is our y tilde, the midpoint. And then we have some uh, 
points here now, which depends on a slack parameter. And let's now suppose they look like this. And in this specific case, what we have is our y tilde minus this parameter epsilon. And then we have a new kind of slack region here, where this is given by y tilde plus this parameter epsilon. This is going to be defined by a new parameter, C, which is going to play the same role as the slack parameter, which we had before. And below here, we're going to have an additional parameter, which is larger than zero. So what we can do now is to express the optimization by introducing some slack variables. So these play the same role as slack variables. And we are going to define uh, for each a value of x. Now let me bring this up. For each x of i, we have two such parameters. So we have two variables. And these variables are c of i larger than zero and a parameter c of i tilde which is also larger than zero and when uh, when we have when this y of i sorry not that one when y of i is larger than y of i tilde, the model which we have made, plus epsilon. And so we would have this case when epsilon is C of i is larger than zero. Then we would have y of i is larger. The output which we want to predict is larger than the model plus this insensitivity parameter. And we would be in this region. And then with the additional parameter, what we would have then is that when we have this parameter larger than zero corresponds to y of i less than the y of i tilde, which is predicted by our model, minus this insensitivity parameter, which we have to set up. So what we need to set up then is a condition for a given target point to be inside. So the final thing which we need now is to need the conditions for a target point y of i to be inside what's normally called this epsilon tube. What that means is that we want now to set up a similar set of Lagrangians as we had before, but we're now what we want is something which lives inside this area here. So we are going to use this parameter epsilon to define a kind of connection with a slack parameter. And we want to define this region, which is encompassed by the two red lines. And this is going to be the region which we will use to make our prediction. And that region is going to be defined by this parameter epsilon here. And you can think of that as a kind of error parameter, which tells us how good the description is. So the whole thing we want to do now is with these slack parameters and this parameter epsilon, is simply to be able to define this epsilon tube region or just what I would call the goodness region. And with these kind of preliminaries, we can then set up a Lagrangian and then we can de develop the same type of optimization problem. But you see now that the whole support vector machine philosophy started with classifications, which is much, much easier to deal with. So when you move to the regression type of problems, it's more difficult actually to translate this. And that means that you have to cook up this kind of 
what I would call a Mickey Mouse cost function, uh, which uh, works okay. But what you will see often is that these kind of uh, support vector machines on regression problems do not do as well as typically neural networks or standard linear regression or kernel regression problems. So uh, I see my time is uh, well over today. Uh, I'm going to put these uh, things uh, online, uh, but next week I'm going to quickly repeat uh, the discussion on support vector machines. The main emphasis there is on classification problems, as you have seen. And then uh, we are going to use next Thursday to discuss unsupervised learning methods, and then in particular, principal component analysis and clustering methods. And then Friday next week is our last lecture. And then we're just going to summarize and just see what we have done and discuss project number three as well. So if actually people would like to present something next week for project number three, there's still a possibility. Okay, let's take a break. Eh? You guys need a weekend. Thanks for coming here. Eh? Take care. So to those of you online, happy weekend, guys.